The New York Times called it the greatest secret of World War II. It was called the ENIAC, and it was created by a man named John Mockley, along with Presper Eckert. In the family tree of computing, it's usually at the top. Almost every digital device is a descendant of the ENIAC. But for many years, no one realized the ENIAC was itself based on another computer. It would take three decades before the connection between John Mockley and John Vincent Adonassoff was revealed. The discovery, which would ultimately upend the entire industry, was made by a 29-year-old lawyer who was assigned the case of a lifetime. And said, I, I uh, got this really big lawsuit that's probably going to take um, uh, five or ten years of your life. You want to sign on to something like that. I, I don't know whether I thought he was kidding or not, but it turned out he wasn't kidding. It took five years of my life. Charlie Call was representing Honeywell, who were trying to get a start in the computer business. For Honeywell, and a lot of small companies, the problem was the ENIAC patent, controlled by IBM and Sperry Rand. You, know, you have to remember that in, in 1955, as, as late as 1955, IBM and Sperry Rand together had 95% of the business. They were not just the big guys in town. They, they were the, both of them, the two 800-pound gorillas that were running everything. These students were having a great deal of trouble doing the calculations themselves. It took me back to the day when I was working on uh, my own thesis, and they were spending much more than a month doing actual calculations. This problem of calculations pressed me very hard. And he told us his story about that he, he was just worrying and worrying and worrying about how to solve this problem. All his grad students were stuck. He was stuck. They just, they couldn't get anything done because they couldn't solve these problems. So he started working on solutions uh, and nothing worked. Adam Asoff's computer was not just ahead of its time. It introduced a brand new way of thinking. Mechanical computers worked by moving around gears and levers. Adonassoff's machine moved around electrons. He had a hard time getting people interested in, or even understanding, his ideas. So my, my reaction was, if, if he continues to take that position, uh, uh, we win, because, because we can prove that isn't true. He's, he's gonna, uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna have to figure out a better story than, than it didn't happen, because it did happen. In the case of Honeywell versus Barry Rand, it was important to show not only that Mockley had seen Adonassoff's computer, but it was key to establish what had happened next. Did ideas from the ABC make their way into the ENIAC? Uh, in 1943, Mockley declared that he had found a new way to build a computer. I asked him to tell me how. And he said he couldn't, it was classified. I really believed him pretty much. I pretty much believed him. On the surface, the ENIAC was massively different from the ABC. The ENIAC filled an entire room. It used 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighed 30 tons. It reportedly dimmed the lights of Philadelphia every time it was turned on. As Adonassoff filed away his sketches and diagrams, Eckert and Mockley moved forward. They patented the ENIAC and founded the world's first computer company. The computer had been an obscure device for scientists and the military. But by the 1950s, computers helped with the census and predicted elections. By the 60s, even Batman would have a computer. The ENIAC was on its way to becoming one of the most valuable patents in the world. One person that took notice was Tom Watson, the head of IBM. IBM's business was based on tools like punch cards, tabulators, and the typewriter, products the electronic computer would eventually make obsolete. Tom Watson was worried and concerned because of the great press that ENIAC was getting. It wanted to get the company into electronics. And of course, 
there would be a concern that there were or would be patents on the ENIAC which would hamper IBM. It, it might have happened, but it was no big deal because I didn't really learn anything I didn't already know, and, 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 and it was getting brushed aside. Obviously, we couldn't let it get brushed aside. What Honeywell had on their side was the sheer amount of evidence. In fact, for the first time in a U.S. court, they used a computer to keep track of everything, over 25,000 pieces of evidence. Mockley had written a letter to Dr. Atmasoff basically saying, would the way be clear to me if I chose to do it to build a machine like yours? And he said, I, I'm thinking about building an Atmasoff computer a la Bush differential analyzer. And I quote, is there any objection from your point of view to my building some sort of computer which incorporates some of the features of your machine, your machine being the Atmasoff? Very computer. It can best be described as the trial of the century. Two inventors, both holding a claim on the first computer. Testimony from the highest levels of industry, science, and the military. And while the trial was technically two companies wrestling over a patent, the decision would affect everyone who would ever use a computer. On October 19, 1973, five years after Honeywell first issued their challenge, Judge Earl Larson delivered his verdict. Eckerd and Mockley had derived the ENIAC from the work of John Adonassoff. One of the most valuable patents in the world was declared no longer valid. And just like that, the electronic computer was no longer controlled by Sperry, or IBM, or anyone. But the trial was not actually about who invented the computer. It was about who owned it. And the final answer was no one company owned the computer anymore, which meant that now it belonged to everyone. The first computer I designed became the Apple One eventually. I passed it out for free. I gave away all my designs, all my code, no copyright notices. Here, build your own, build your own, build your own. The internet wouldn't be what it is were it not for the fact that there are millions of people who can try new ideas out every day without asking anyone's permission. I would like to see at Nassau remembered the way we remember the Wright brothers, as the person who put everything together to make something really happen in a revolutionary way that there have been other people who have contributed to the technology before and since, but the big step forward was made by John Atnassoff. I'm very grateful that fate should have placed me at the beginning of this great adventure. I had great expectations, but none that matched present achievements and none that could possibly match what we all expect of the future. Since the beginning, many men have worked on computing, and many have furnished elements that were important. This applies to Mockley, Eckert, some members of the staff, such as Burks, Brainerd, and others. Historically, the list cont should contain Pascal, Napier, and Zuzel. Credit must also go to the originators of our number system, which began computing. What each man accomplishes depends on his brains and energy but also on the surrounds in which he works. In this, timing is important. In a larger sense, no man invents anything. He builds and extends a little with his friends and on the shoulders of others. We humans are born inventors. We're always looking for a better tool an improved concept, a new solution. Our imagination is almost limitless. But the difference between an invention working and not working is in the numbers. The real obstacle is doing the math. Equations could take weeks to figure out, and more and more, these numbers were needed for everything, 
from building modern cities to bombing them. Our dreams were becoming so elaborate as to be almost out of reach. His ideas may have transformed the world, but they never made him rich. My theory was, let's not worry about it, let's go on and enjoy life. And that's what we did. As Adam Asoff goes on with his life, so begins the life of the digital computer. Over the next two decades, each new incarnation is faster and more powerful, an evolution which has continued uninterrupted until this day. John Mockley and Presper Eckert did not make the same mistake as Iowa State. 